Welcome to Intestacy, the will you didn't know you had. Or, as I prefer to call it, what you need to know about the zombie apocalypse. My name is Robert Jewett, and I'm here because I love the law and I love teaching. And I believe people make better choices when they understand both what it is they're doing and why they're doing it. And yes, I really am a licensed attorney in the state of Texas. Today's talk is about intestacy. That's the legal state of dying without a will. And we're also going to talk about the will Texas gives you. Now, obviously, it's not a will in the strict legal sense, but the Texas intestacy statutes do control who's going to get your property if you don't have a will. I talk with people all the time who say, or at least believe, that they don't need a will because they don't really have anything. And the truth is, you probably have more than you think you do. And kind of ironically, the less you have, the more important a will may be, because without a will, your family may not be able to benefit from what you have. Let's say you have a small amount in a bank account, maybe small is relative for everybody, but you know, it could be a few hundred, could be a few thousand dollars. If you don't have a will, your family may not be able to get to that money or in order to get to it, they're going to have to spend more money than is actually there. So that money is sort of lost, at least for a time being. Now, some folks have maybe a house and a car, or a little money in the bank. And certainly they don't consider themselves rich, but they assume they know who is going to get their stuff when they die. And this is especially true with blended families, where you have children from a previous relationship. If you don't have a will, things can get really ugly. Over half the people who come to see me because a loved one has died tell me their loved one didn't have a will. And our goal for today is for you to understand exactly what that looks like. It's not pretty, but it is avoidable. But first, we need to cover a few formalities. To begin, this information is for educational purposes only. I am not your attorney. And watching this video does not make me your attorney, nor is it intended to create an attorney-client relationship. If you choose to seek me out, I'll be happy to discuss your situation with you, but it does not mean I will take your case. And finally, you should know this information only applies to the state of Texas. If you live outside of Texas, your laws might be slightly different or they might be a lot different. I don't know. I'm only licensed in Texas, so we're only going to talk about Texas. Ben Franklin said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. But when you fail to create a will, it's not you who's going to suffer. After all, at this point, you're dead. It's your family who's going to suffer and have to deal with the problems that you leave behind. So let's see what that looks like. A will really amounts to the rules about who is going to get your stuff. So let's say you die without a will. So what happens if we don't have any rules to follow? Well, the Texas legislature steps in to save the day, and they do that via Texas Estates Code Chapter 201, which we call the intestacy statutes. If someone dies without a will, these statutes provide the rules to determine who is going to get the person's stuff. Now, what the legislature tried to do was to come up with a set of rules that they thought most people would want. And while what they came up with might be okay in some situations, these rules were largely created over a hundred years ago so they don't really reflect what life is like today. There's obviously going to be some bad things that can happen, and we're going to look at what some of those bad things are in hopes that we can avoid them. And to do that, we're going to have to answer four very important questions. Are you married or are you single? 
do you have children? And is your spouse the biological parent of all of your children? Now, this really does mean all, not just those you want to acknowledge. And if you're a guy, and you even suspect you might have children out there you don't know about, or that you think no one's going to find out about, you need to pay attention, because these are going to affect the people you leave behind. Now, for our purposes, to be the biological parent also means the parent if you have an adopted child together. And finally, we need to know if you have any separate property. You may not know what separate property is yet, but don't worry, we're going to explain what that is here in a bit. So our first situation is what happens if you are single. And by that, I mean you are not currently married. Now, let's be clear about something here. A lot of people will call me and say, well, Mr. Jewett, I'm separated. You need to know there is no such thing as separation in the state of Texas. You are either married or you are not married. And once you are married, either formally or under the common law, if you have not been divorced through a court legal process, you are still married. I've had kids come to me before thinking they were going to get property through their parent or their dad because their dad hadn't been in a relationship for a long time. But come to find out, the marriage was never legally dissolved. That means the person that your parent was married to is still going to get a share and maybe a large share. So let me encourage you right now. If you think that you're separated, you really are not. Please see an attorney and get that resolved. And if this situation applies to your parent or the person you're in a relationship with, get them to an attorney right now. Okay, so let's assume you really are single when you die. If you've never had children, your parents are going to divide everything equally. Now that includes personal property. That's things like furniture and cars and clothing and all that kind of stuff. And real property, which is like a house or land. If both of your parents are alive, they divide everything equally. If only one of your parents is alive, any brothers or sisters you have are going to share in the deceased parents portion that they would have got. It'll be divided equally. Now, if you don't have any brothers or sisters, then everything's going to go to the surviving parent. That means they get everything. But what if both of your parents are deceased? Well, if you have brothers and sisters, then they're going to divide your property equally. And if you don't have brothers and sisters, and sisters, it's going to go up the family tree. That means maybe grandparents. And if your grandparents are deceased, then it could spread out to aunts and uncles, and then things get really complicated. We're not going to deal with that situation right here, but you need to know it gets pretty complex if that happens. And in most cases, those aren't people that you intend for your property to go to anyway. So what that means is, is if you don't have a will, and it's going that far back, somebody you don't know about is probably going to get your stuff. Now, let's consider what happens if you're single and you do have children. Your children are going to divide everything equally. Now, if you're old enough that you have grandkids, and let's say then your child dies, leaving children of their own, those grandkids are going to get their parents' share. Now let's look at the situation of what happens if you're married. Well, the first thing we need to look at is what is community property and what is separate property? Community property is property you obtained from the efforts of you and your spouse during the marriage. Any property obtained during the marriage is presumed to be community property. So this could be stuff like income from your job. It could be investments. 
It could be a house that you purchase together. Even if the house is only in one of your names, you could still have a community property interest if community property funds were used to help pay for that. Separate property is property you own or was owned by you prior to the marriage or obtained from outside the marriage. This could be like an inheritance from your rich uncle or your parents, or maybe even a gift. So if you're married and you don't have any children, and remember that means that you don't have children with either your spouse or anybody else. Well, if that happens, your spouse gets everything. Now that's pretty easy. But let's look at what happens if you have children. Now, when you have children, we're going to face this critical decision again of, is your spouse the biological parent of all of your children? And if they're not, it's going to create some problems for us. So we start with the easy case. If yes, the spouse gets all of the community property. They get one third of your separate personal property. Remember separate property is property you obtained from outside the marriage, whether it was before the marriage occurred or through gift or inheritance. And they're gonna get this thing called a life estate and any separate real property you have. We'll talk about life estates here in just a couple minutes. The kids get the rest. Well, what's the rest? It's that two thirds separate property that you may have, your personal property. They're also gonna get two thirds of the real property, but it's subject to a life estate. However, if your children, your spouse is not the biological parent of all of your children, welcome to the zombie apocalypse. So here we are. You're married, your spouse is not the biological parent of all your children. We're gonna look again at separate and community property. And I'm gonna start over here on the separate property side because it looks very similar. In fact, it's exactly the same as what we saw before. Your separate property, your surviving spouse is gonna get one third of it. Your children are going to get two thirds and your separate real property, your surviving spouse is going to get a life estate in one third and the children get two thirds subject to that life estate. The community property is where the big difference is. And a lot of people are really shocked when they find this out. First off, your one half share of any community property goes to your children, not to your spouse. If you've been married for any length of time, or if you married when you were fairly young, your estate is almost certainly going to be composed of mostly community property. So if you die without a will, that property is not going to go to your spouse. Now I see a lot of folks who were divorced 10 or 20 years ago, and for various reasons, they might have very little involvement with the kids of those that previous marriage. Nonetheless, if you die, those kids, not your spouse, are going to take your one half community property interest. Now, this is particularly problematic if you own a home. Okay, because some things happen when you own a home that it, get a little bit more complicated. But remember, if the home you own is also your homestead, your spouse is going to get a life estate. That means your kids can't kick them out, kick out your spouse. But if your spouse stops living there, then the kids can force the sale of the house. There's a couple other things that happen. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. So what is this life estate thing? Well, a life estate allows the right of possession so long as the person, in this case your spouse, lives in the home. But there are some problems. 
your spouse will be unable to refinance the mortgage in most cases. So let's say that your spouse wants to refinance because the rates have dropped or they want to extend the payments to make them more affordable. They're not going to be able to do that unless all of the children, and I'm talking about kids from your prior marriage, agree to the refinance. Not only that, the mortgage company is likely to require, almost certainly will require, that all of the owners sign the new mortgage. Well, that's your kids and they don't have the right to live there. So they're almost certainly not going to do that. So now we've got this big conflict between your spouse and your kids. Now there's also a problem if the house gets sold. Let's say your spouse can't afford it. So your spouse sells the house thinking they're going to go buy a new one. Well, as soon as that happens, when the house is sold, everyone's got to agree on the sales price and the children get their cut. If any of the children are minors, they can't legally agree to this process. So the court is going to appoint what's called an attorney ad litem to represent the kids. And yes, that costs more money. While your spouse is living there, they only own half the house, but they are solely responsible for the mortgage if they are on it. So you can see this is really not looking too good for your surviving spouse. So again, if you are in a relationship with somebody who has children from a prior marriage or prior relationship and they do not have a will, you need to get them on this. And finally, the surviving spouse is solely responsible for maintenance and upkeep. That could be simple stuff like mowing the lawn, it also includes things like painting and main, making sure that the house is, the value of the house is preserved. Uh, if there's a need for a capital improvement, like a new roof, your surviving spouse might be able to get some contribution from the kids. But again, that's going to open a big can of worms because the kids might not agree. And then there's a legal process. So that gets really ugly. But wait, there's more. Intestacy is not free. There's an, there's an equivalent of a tax, of course, because the government created it. Now, it's not actually called a tax, but there is a significant cost to using this intestacy plan. Because there is no will, your heirs must be proven. The court is simply not going to take your word for who the heirs are. It doesn't matter. If you can show marriage licenses or birth certificates, the court has to be sure there's not anybody else who's entitled to some property. And to do that, the court has to appoint an attorney ad litem to represent the unknown heirs. Now, the unknown heirs are anyone who might not have shown up because, again, the courts are not simply going to take your word for it. There might not be a love child hiding somewhere, but the court has to be certain. So the court appoints the attorney ad litem to investigate. And that attorney ad litem is not free. In Harris County, the fees for an ad litem can range from about $500 on the low end to $950 for sort of an average case. Now, an average case is where the ad litem doesn't have to do a whole lot of work. That is, we can show who the current spouse is, we have birth certificates for all the kids, and there's not anybody that we know about who hasn't shown up yet. Now, the ad litem is still going to have to do that research, but we can try and minimize it a little bit. Now, if you're a person who has a large family and that family has a lot of heirs or there's, you've had kids with several different people, the cost for the ad litem alone can easily be $1,000 or more. Also, if you have any minor children, court supervision of this whole process is going to be mandatory. That means the court's going to supervise everything that happens in your estate. And yes, that's going to cost more money too. 
Pretty much the whole idea of more court supervision should equate to higher costs for you, at least in your head. In Harris County, I would say intestacy costs at least two to three times as much to resolve the estate than if a person has a will. And that doesn't include all the fighting that's going to occur as part of this process. So at this stage, if I were to ask you who needs a will, I hope the answer is pretty obvious. Everybody, everybody needs a will. If you don't have a will, you are leaving a dumpster fire for your spouse or your family to have to deal with. And if your spouse doesn't have a will, you are the person who is going to have to deal with that dumpster fire. The real question should be, how do I get one? Well, what if I told you it didn't have to be expensive and you didn't have to drive downtown? So the good news is I've got a couple of follow-up videos that will answer the question, how do you create a will? I encourage you to watch those. And at the end, you'll have at least a minimum viable will that will help your family avoid the zombie apocalypse. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you on a down note. Those videos really do already exist, so you can go straight to the rescue of the portion of the program. I don't want to leave anybody hanging like they did at the end of Infinity War. Uh, this is going to resolve all of that for you. And I want you to know that it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be expensive. So until next time, I'm attorney Robert Jewett reminding you that the better you plan, the better you'll sleep. See you next time.